me introduce to you Dr. Patrick Corrigan. He is a distinguished professor of psychology at the Illinois Institute of Technology. Uh, prior to that, Corrigan was professor of psychiatry and executive director uh, of the University of Chicago Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation, but I will get him to introduce himself more fully. He is here today to talk to us about beating the stigma of psychosis, and that's such a pertinent topic. We've already seen that come up numerous times in the news lately, perhaps related to mass shootings, how um, there's been a call for uh, more mental health treatment, um, which of course is never a bad thing to have more opportunities for people for healing, but it also equates a lot of violence with mental health, psychosis or extreme states. So this feels like a super pertinent topic. It, we didn't expect all this to happen prior, but I, it couldn't be happening at a better time for us to address this. And I'm sure Dr. Corrigan will have some excellent insights for us. I will say to everyone present that at ISPS we've been having a lot of talk recently about language and the phrases that we use and how some phrases can be uh, potentially marginalizing for people, offensive to people, but I really believe we can't talk about stigma without mentioning some of these terms. So we may be talking about terms such as psychosis, schizophrenia, mental illness, and those terms may not sit with you as the way you want to um, understand your experiences or other people's experiences. But again, we can't address stigma unless we face those topics head on. It's exactly why we're here to face stigma head on. So uh, I am going to stop talking now and I'm going to hand it over to Pat. Um, Pat, go ahead, introduce yourselves and let's begin. Um, welcome. I'm speaking to you from Chicago. Um, we're sort of at the end of the heat wave going through the country. Uh, actually, I'm sitting in front of a fan right now if you're a word the background because the air conditioning, you know, all that great at IIT. And what I want to talk to you about today is the stigma of mental illness and the fact that our research over the last 20 years suggests the stigma can be as big a problem as the symptoms and disabilities itself. And so to jump right in, we know what stigma is. It's a disrespectful image of people frequently representing them as dangerous, calling them names like schizo. And we know our goal. Um, I joined with Leah in your organization tackling stigma to the degree to which we can decrease stigma as a degree to which we can help people with psychosis achieve their goals. And so what I want to do with you today is briefly talk about what stigma is, but much more important, how to focus on how it might be diminished. Actually, you're going to spend some time on approaches that might seem to work so well that actually perhaps don't, um, and then focusing on what we really believe our work shows changing the stigmas in the focus of disclosing and having people share their stories in a program we developed called Honest Open Proud to do that. Um, so I want to talk today about understanding stigma from the research world. Uh, in 2015, the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine convened a panel of experts. Uh, I was actually on the panel. NASM, National Academy of Science, works at the pleasure of the White House and of um, the Congress. And what I want to share with you is findings we had there about how to change stigma. And equally, a recent book that, we, that I wrote um, called Stigma and Health in Columbia University Press, I'm talking again about the unintended consequences of mental health campaigns and the more effective way to talk about it. And so we're talking about this from psychosis. Um, I was a psychiatry professor for about 15 years. And so psychosis evokes all sorts of ideas of medicine and symptoms and medications and the like. But actually, when you talk about social justice, that's not an issue of medicine. It's an issue of social justice or social injustice, as it were. Um, this is Martin Luther King Jr. coming across the Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, perhaps one of the greatest heroes in social justice in the United States, or what we've done well in the last couple, de um, couple decades on promoting the rights of the LGBTQ community. And even in the disability world, there are examples of heroes that have tried to tear down the stigma um, the gentleman in the, in the cowboy hat and the wheelchair lower right hand corner was Justin Dart, and he was one of the heroes in the disability movement. The problem, ironically, in calling this a social justice 
is that progressive people like all of us on the call want to rush in and fix it. And don't get me wrong, we should, but what happens as a result is we end up making mistakes. And so many of you may remember the military in the time of Bill Clinton actually had a, a homophobia campaign to identify soldiers, sailors and the like who were gay and drum them out of the service. And so the military started, don't ask, don't tell, which at the time seemed to be a reasonable idea, but in retrospect, we realized that just only promotes closetedness and asking any group and any identity to keep it a secret in the closet is horrible for their health. Unfortunately, like anything in government, it took 20 years plus until President Obama's administration came along and changed it. And another one, which seems to be good intention that actually kind of went astray, which some of us remember Jerry Lewis had his labor, th uh, labor telethon for MBA every year. I'm trying to help Jerry's kids and perhaps turning this whole MBA thing into a kid thing. Um, but it led to posters. This is actually Ben Matlin who as an adult said, you know, he wanted to grow up to be a fireman and he didn't like the image here of saying certain things couldn't be uh, appropriate for us. But actually, you know, Jerry Lewis used to do this for 48 hours straight and get tired and make mistakes. And he kind of slipped in the stigma once when he called MDA, people of MDA is God's goose. And so this gives us an idea of what we're focusing on. We do not want to explain the issues of stigma of mental illness in terms of pity, that people with mental illness are pitiful and we need to bestow on them opportunities, but rather parity. And so thanks Leah for introducing me. Let me say I come to this issue wearing several hats. Uh, I've been working in the area of psychiatric rehabilitation for 30 plus years, setting up vocational and community-based programs for people with serious mental illness. I actually wrote the textbook on it. I was a journal editor. I've also done research on the area. I've been supported by NIH for about 20 years in our stigma work. But I think what really brings me to this discussion today is that I am a person with lived experience. I've been diagnosed with major depression, bipolar disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, been hospitalized, know the embarrassment of lining up for that one phone on the unit to call my wife and tell her I wouldn't be at da my daughter Elizabeth's school night that night. And so stigma is not an abstraction for me. It's, it's a reality that I'm trying to add my two cents in fixing. And again, my particular angle of this is more from research, collecting data, making sense of the best ways to change things and share it with advocates so they can go forward. And so I'm editor of uh, the American Psychological Association Journal on Stigma and Health. So let's talk quickly. What is stigma? Um, Sam Keen, sociologist, wrote a book called Faces of the Enemy, where you look at how through the generations people in power have disempowered and disrespected other groups using images. This says scientists say Negro still in ape stage. I choose to show this abhorrent image for a couple reasons. One is it hits us in the face and exactly what the stigma of psychosis is. It's in the same category as racism, sexism, and the like. And two, this came from an 1890s medical textbook. How we present facts sometimes to perpetuate stigma. Or from World War II Nazi occupied Denmark, we disrespect groups by showing them as animals or what one half the population has done to the other half of the population. So the harder a wife works, the cuter she looks. You know, I'm old enough to, in my lifetime, remembered ads like this. And if there's any good news, and don't get me wrong, I don't think we've wiped out racism, sexism, and the like. If there's any good news, you won't see this kind of stuff anymore, at least in American advertising. Not so with mental illness. I mean, on the way home tonight, all you got to do is listen to talk radio, and they're talking about wackos and psychos and nuts as evidence the stigma is alive and well. Perhaps the biggest evidence that comes from is the idea that people with mental illness are all homicidal maniacs. This is Freddy Krueger from The Nightmare on Elm Street, the most popular cinematic maniac since Darth Vader. And this is Jason from Friday the 13th, part three. You see it in newspapers, like the New York Post says, freed mental patient kills mom. 
or the Daily News say, get the violent crazies off of our streets. Now, this is tabloids. This is what they're supposed to do. It's not right at all, but this is the way they get your attention when you're in a store. This is from the reader. This is several years back. The reader is a very somber, very well-written um, weekly in Chicago. And it's a story about the gentleman on the left who with a drug-induced psychosis killed his wife, um, was sent to Elgin Mental Health Center, which is a forensic unit outside of Chicago, spent years there, was ready to be released and by everybody's standards, by the courts, by the lawyers, by the doctors, they thought a release to the community was called for. Um, Ted Klein, a reporter, wrote a pretty balanced article, but the editor slapped this headline on and he ended up spending even more years at Elgin. You see it in advertising? This offer could get you committed. Crazy Eddie's record asylum. To offer these deals, we have to be committed. Maniac out of control. Now, this is actually from a billboard outside Washington, D.C., a lobster lunacy. I love at this point to point out that people say, are we just being politically correct? I mean, come on, it's a little humor. Can't we lighten up? Of course, the chef does everything but cook. That's what wives are for. Just to realize that is not okay as a way to sell a product. So this is a straight jacket filled up with nuts, which won the Clio Award of Advertising some years back. You see it in comics. This is the Gary Larson cartoon. It has two problems with it. One is the disrespectful image on the pad, just plain nuts. And two, this is a psychiatrist doing it. So if he's laughing at the guy, it must be okay. For this, sir, these gentlemen from the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission are here to explain new rules of mental illness in the workplace. Justin Dart, the guy in a wheelchair I showed you before, had a big role in passing the American with Disabilities Act in 2000. Um, George Herbert Walker Bush signed it. It was in place five years before anybody said it applied to psychiatric disability. Um, when it came out, you got this kind of thing. Alarms, you're gonna get ax murderers or naked people or people in straitjackets at work. S is for Stanley. Stanley's a crazy murderer who likes to murder little boys and girls early Sunday morning. Are you afraid of Stanley? This came from Michelle Silverstein book. Um, I actually got it off my daughter's shelf when she was three. Um, at a young age, they're learning the idea of dangerousness and mental illness. People with mental illness are lovable buffoons. The big stigma about mental illness is that we're all dangerous. Because if you believe we're all dangerous, then you're not going to want to hire us or associate with us. But there are other ones, too. And the one stigma is called benevolent stigma. It doesn't mean it's a nice, okay stigma. It means that we believe people with mental illness, adults, are big dummies, and they can't make decisions for themselves. And so they need a benevolent figure, like a doctor, to tell them what to do. I see it in movies. Um, this is um, Peter Boyle, Michael Keaton, um, Christopher Lloyd. There are three psych patients who get away from their keeper having a zany, silly day popping around Manhattan. Or this actually captures both sides. This is Jim Carrey, me, myself, and Irene as a police officer on the left time. Left side is the big dopey police officer on the right side. He's an evil maniac. And this, how to avoid hiring no lemons, nuts, and flakes. This actually came from a human resource office and a major corporation. Um, they're the ones who are supposed to protect disability rights. And you can see they're making fun. Is it better? I mean, some of these pictures are kind of old. Um, this is actually from downstate Ohio. You're looking in the front window of a printing company. Um, pretend the woman's not there. She's the owner. What do you see looking in the window? You see a stool knocked over, two legs hanging down, a bottle of booze on its side, and, the, and a sign saying contemplating suicide. Get your notes printed here. If that's not a big enough concern, um, she's the owner of the company and asked her what this was about. She said she didn't see the big deal. Or this... Um, this is where um, Nash, John Nash from Beautiful Mind would go when he would relapse, Trenton State Hospitals in a hospital in downstate New Jersey. They had a fire, um, nobody heard, but the next day the headline said, roasted nuts. 
So at least at the gut level, the stigma of mental illness is alive and unfortunately well. What does the research show? Um, colleagues at my Columbia University did a study comparing the degree to which the population, general population, believes people with mental illness are dangerous. And I would be glad to email and talk to people about the literature. The research is complex, but what we know is you grossly overestimate dangerousness in populations compared to what the reality is. So they did a study wanting to compare the degree to which the population believe people with mental illness are dangerous, comparing 1956 and 1996, and maybe it would cut in half, and reality went in the opposite direction. It got twice as bad, and they followed it up 2006, and they got equally bad. Why is this? It's called post hocking the data, but it sort of dovetails on what Leah just said. America's got this god-awful tradition of people um, getting guns and shooting people, and every time it happens, um, people equate mental illness with the issue. In fact, there's a study by colleagues Anthony Jorman and Nicola Reevely in Australia that showed after Sandy Hook the stigma um, about people with schizophrenia in Australia got worse. I actually agree with Leah. I think there's a double-edged sword in the recent Senate, Senate bill um, because they're clearly equating the solution to this violence with mental health. Uh, I think most anything that gets more services for mental health is good, but there's this hidden um, statement that we need to be mindful of.